Good morning. My name is David Menon. I work in intensive care at the University of Cambridge, and I'm going to talk to you today about precision medicine and TBI, and suggest that we might be able to stratify patients for aggressive ICP therapy using MRI and blood biomarkers. These are my conflicts of interest. None of them is directly relevant to the talk that I'm going to give. So we have some guidelines for the management of severe TBI. This is from the Brain Trauma Foundation. And basically it consists of using ICP monitoring and CPP monitoring, which are thought to reduce mortality in the acute phase and consider maintaining systolic blood pressures above either 100 or 110 millimeters of mercury, depending on the age of the patient. There's also a target to maintain intracranial pressure below 22 millimeters of mercury. So these provide us with targets for therapy, and they're based on the fact that we have no current mechanistic therapies. So we have to target secondary injury, namely hypoxia, raised intracranial pressure, and low cerebral perfusion pressure. But despite these guidelines, it remains unclear as to what interventions we should use to achieve these targets, when we should use them, and very importantly, in whom we should use them. Now, this hasn't stopped intensive care units around the world from creating protocols based on what they use to control intracranial pressure and maintain cerebral perfusion pressure. And like many other units, we have a protocol which goes through a variety of phases. It starts with basic intensive care, followed by blood pressure elevation and optimization of blood gases. In the pres presence of persistent raised cranial pressure, we use hypertonic solutions, in our case, usually hypertonic saline. We might use varying degrees of hypothermia, deep in sedation up to the level that you get to burst suppression, and eventually use decompressive craniectomy for refractory intracranial hypertension. And these protocols are common across the world and fairly recently have been uh, amalgamated by the Seattle Severe Traumatic Brain Injury Consensus Conference into two protocol algorithms which have been published on intensive care medicine. However, we have some problems with this. There's no evidence-based medicine support for, particularly for third tier therapies, which as you can see are increasing in intensity, but also have more side effects. For example, the DECRA trial showed that there was harm from decompressive craniectomy the Eurotherm 32 to 35 trials showed that there was harm from hypothermia. And the recently published Polar trial, though showed no harm from hypothermia, showed no benefit from hypothermia. Does this mean that we should not use these interventions? Perhaps, but I would make this point. This set of EBM publications made these recommendations here with an ICP threshold of 20, here using decompressive craniectomy as an early intervention and using hypothermia as an early, and in the case of polar, a universal intervention. And given that these therapies have severe side effects, the question is whether the disease was so bad that the side effects were warranted. To quote Shakespeare, were these diseases desperate enough to be using such desperate appliance? This is important because deaths directly attributable to traumatic brain injury are due to refractory intracranial hypertension. And particularly for decompressive craniectomy, which is right, right at the bottom of this ladder of therapies, effective decompression means that otherwise healthy patients do not die of extreme ICP elevations. So this, removing the lid off the top of the head, represents a potentially irreversible intervention. Given this, we need to reconcile what we can do against what we should do, because if you have really bad outcome, but no mortality, we may be saving a life that's not worth living. The results are a bit contradictory. DECRA suggested that early decompressive craniectomy showed no benefit and rescue ICP, which was a late rescue therapy with decompressive craniectomy, showed benefit, but at the risk of very severe disability in a subproportion of patients. I've framed this discussion in the context of decompressive craniectomy, but it probably applies to all of our third tier therapies, the ones that have the most extreme risk of side effects. So 
to un answer this question, I'm going to seek some insights from our recent center TBI study, which included 4,500 patients approximately in the core study, of whom 2,140 or so were in the ICU. This was conducted in many centers across Europe. Let's look at what the CT scans at admission in these patients showed by way of intracranial hypertension. We found in the 4,000 uh, or so patients where we had complete data sets that about 60% of patients had some intracranial abnormality, which scaled with the severity of injury. And those patients who were seen in the ER and sent away had a very small proportion of abnormalities, whereas by the time you got to the ICU, only about 10% of patients had no abnormality on their CT. What about raising to cranial pressure? If you looked for basal cisterns being absent or compressed, or the presence of midline shift, both of which are hallmarks of significantly elevated intracranial pressure, we found that 30 to 50% of patients in, in the ICU stratum showed signs of such severe intracranial hypertension. We also had evidence of diffuse edema and between 11 to 60% across the group showed signs of some edema and severe diffuse edema was seen in about 10% of patients. So this would seem to make good sense that CT is telling us which of these patients have raised cranial pressure. And it's certainly the standard workhorse because it's very good at defining brain swelling and by detecting extraaxial hematomas planning surgery for space-occupying lesions. However, CT may miss prognosis-defining lesions that do not increase ICP, such as brainstem injury and diffuse axonal injury. These lesions have outcome impact, which is completely independent of ICP elevation and is not helped by its control. And if they are the primary drivers of outcome, ICP control simply won't make a difference to outcome. So, it's reasonable to conclude that we need to differentiate two groups of patients, those in whom marked ICP elevations are a cause for poor outcome, and those in whom marked ICP elevations are just a marker for poor outcome, because ICP treatment may modify outcome in this group, but will not make a difference to outcome in this group. So can we detect these occult lesions? Yes, we can. MRI can detect these lesions. Here you have a contemporaneous CT and MR. The MR showing a brainstem lesion, which is likely to make a big impact on outcome, not seen in the CT. And similarly here, susceptibility weighted MR, which shows microhemorrhages because the sequence is exquisitely sensitive to diffuse microvascular injury. And MR can actually uh, detect these and help us prognosticate in, in, this, in these settings. However, acute MRI in all TBI is simply logistically not possible at present. Well, we could do MRI when the ICP goes up, but once the ICP is markedly elevated and we are struggling to maintain it, it increases risks in what is already a difficult procedure undertaking MR in a critically ill patient. So we need to find ways to identify patients who could benefit from an early MR so that we can image them with MRI at the point when their ICP is still not markedly elevated, but we don't wind up imaging so many people in whom it's not going to show benefit. And what sort of percentage of patients would that be? So here I'm going to show you the first 500 or so patients in the MR study from the center TBI cohort, which was a subset of the, of the population. And of those, 384 patients had their first MRI within the third, first three weeks after injury. And I'm going to compare them against the CT at admission. Most of these MRs were done in the second week. And what I'm going to show you does not include quantitative MRI or diffusion tensor imaging and no functional magnetic resonance imaging. It includes all strata, patients who came to the ER, who were admitted to the wards or admitted directly to the ICU. And so it includes a broad range of severities. And if you look at this um, diagram here, you can see that the CT was negative in 55% and positive in 45% in this subgroup. 
And if you looked at the MR, that was slightly reversed. It was positive in just um, under 55% and negative in just over 45%. So there's a mismatch, but it's not huge. If you start asking which are the patients in whom the CT was positive, but the MR was negative, or on the other hand, the MR was positive, but the CT was negative, you find that surprisingly, about 8% of the patients here had a positive CT, but a negative MR, and about 16% of the patients here had a positive MR, but a negative CT. What were the lesions that caused this? Up here, you had more contusions detected by MR, and as you might expect, more traumatic axonal injury, whereas CT was detecting more traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage and more extradural hemorrhages. So the questions we have to ask are, is this difference uh, in sensitivity of the MRI or just poor timing? Because I've told you most of the MRs were in the second week, whereas the CT was acute. We can ask whether where both show lesions, can MRI add prognostic information? And here where both are negative, can these more sophisticated MR tools add some prognostic information? But we have conventional MR here that we can look at. And the big question to ask is whether the detection of CT negative MR positive lesions could identify patients who are less likely to benefit from aggressive ICP treatment and allow us to enrich this population to increase MR yield. So one way we can do this is by using blood biomarkers. And as part of Center TBR, we have blood bi these blood biomarkers measured in a large proportion of the cohort. And here we have data that was published in Lancet Biomedicine in just under 3,000 patients. We have a range of biomarkers, and these have supposedly different utilities. This nice review article from Hendrik Zetterberg and Kai Bleno showed what we might expect from these. Some of these are markers of neuronal body injury, such as NSC and UCHL1. Some of these are markers of axonal injury, such as NFL and uh, myelin basic protein, and some of these of dendritic injury, such as tau. Some of these are markers of axon of uh, uh, astrocyte injury, particularly S100B and GFAT. So we have here the uh, data from U et al. from track TBI. And what that shows is that unlike what we might expect from here, the elevation of, of brain biomarkers is not directly related to the type of injury. And indeed, in traumatic axonal injury and diffuse axonal injury, we see the marked elevation of all biomarkers, particularly GFAP, even though that is thought to be an astrocytic biomarker. Similarly, the tracked TBI uh, study has shown that if you take patients who are actually uh, CT negative, but have MR positivity, prediction of that MR positivity is clearly shown by the presence of elevation in GFAP. Now, can we take the um, data that we have here, which is primarily in the mild TBI population, and ask similar questions of the severe TBI populations that we actually see in the ICU? In center TBI, if you look at GFAP elevation, what you can see is that the level of GFAP in the CT positive patients scales with the severity of injury. In mild injuries, moderate and severe injuries, you can find that depending on the GCS, it's always higher in the patients who have CT abnormalities, but uh, it tends to get worse as the severity of injury increases. If we focus on the severe patients, what you can see is those patients who have no CT abnormality, some proportion of them have elevated biomarkers. And the question is whether some of these CT negative biomarker positive patients have occult diffuse axonal injury, which is not detected by CT, but could be detected by MR. And so we could use this as a screening test to undertake MR in this subpopulation of patients. So to conclude, I think I've shown you that patients who die directly from TBI die of raised intracranial pressure. Aggressive ICP treatment, barbiturates, hypothermia, decompressive craniectomy, 
can increase survival by up to 20%, as we've shown in the rescue ICP trial. Such survival is associated with acceptable functional outcome in many patients, but this is at the cost of a poor quality survival in others, and there's about a 50-50 split between these two. We want to reduce the number of patients in this subgroup who have third-tier therapies, and we need better stratification of injury severity and selection of aggressive therapies to achieve this. We can use neuromonitoring to titrate therapy, and there will be other talks in the session that will talk about titration of therapy with neuromonitoring. But it does not address the underlying TB, TBI severity and likely prognosis, which may not be directly related to ICP severity. What we need to do is to separate two groups of patients, those in whom intractable ICP elevation is a consequence of devastating injury. And here, treating this may not make a difference and those in which it is a cause of devastating brain injury and treating this will make a difference. The distribution to these groups in the refractory ICP population is unknown. We have some prognostic markers, age, initial GCS, pupillary reactivity in the CT, but we've, I've shown you that there are some occult lesions that are not detectable by CT. I've shown you that MR can identify some of these CT occult prognosis-defining lesions such as traumatic axonal injury and brainstem lesions. But early MR in all patients is simply not feasible, and late MR in refractory ICP elevation is dangerous. And the suggestion I make is that blood biomarkers undertaken early may identify a subgroup of patients where early MR is indicated especially and allow us to undertake it in a small proportion of patients where it could make a difference to our management plans. I'll finish by acknowledging the team science and center TBI. The core paper that we published in Lancet Neurology last year has many authors, but we are very lucky in that we are allowed to represent the work of many more. And the authors who are listed on PubMed include over 250 authors from 137 research and recruiting centers. And the work I've presented is due to their hard efforts. Thank you.